Zealy presents a thrilling new program, Comeback Story. And here is your host, one of America's greatest showmen, Toastmaster and humanitarian, George Jessel. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank all of you. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is the third in a series of our play called Comeback Story. And each story tells about some person who, against enormous odds, is fighting his or her way back to the top. And it is the hope, myself, together with my sponsor, the Sealy Mattress Company, and perhaps with your help, too, will speed these people on their comeback trail. Now, you know Bobby Breen, whom you saw two weeks ago, has made five television appearances since he came here. And not only that, he is also playing at the Pittsburgh Cobra. And I want to tell you this, that he has been given other engagements, including appearing on my television show on this Sunday night. And last week, you must know that we uh, showed you a man called George Spex Tuposa, who, despite his blindness, is still playing baseball in a way because he's writing a book for Sterling Publications, an instruction of baseball for children. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, our path is just rolling along in helping other people. And so, right on now to tonight's comeback story. And I must tell you this because tonight's honored guest is quite different from the others of our comeback stories. To begin with, she has been in a way always coming back to all the early struggles, to all the long successes, to the applause and acclaim, even through the angry turbulence of her ups and downs, she's kept coming back with every song she sang. And second, and let's get on with this straight, in the more realistic sense, the big comeback of her career was launched, not tonight, but over five years ago, when there was a year of darkness, when she fell victim to one of society's most dreaded illnesses, the use of narcotics. And when the year of penalty was over, the people, the loving people, who are so identified closely with this artist said, well, honey, the pressure is off, you're with us, you've come back, and so be it. But all the pressures are not off, not enough to unleash the full power of this lady of entertainment. So tonight, by adding just a little bit of understanding, you can help tonight's guest on her comeback trail. But to really understand her, you've got to understand the blues. For here is the most unique artist of modern times and modern blues. You see, despite the success and the money and the breaks, she is the blues. And the blues can be bitter, they can be warm, they can be charged with self-pity, or they can be mean. But warm or mean, the blues are always lonely. no one who has heard that voice can fail to know its owner. There's only one voice like it, but there's only one gal that they call Lady Day, the great Billie Holiday. Billy? <laughs> Billy, it's a, it's a privilege to have you with us tonight. Thank you, George. It's an honor to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. And by the way, where did you get that name, Lady Day? Well, Lester Young, he was a saxophone player with Count Basie's band, and he came to live with my mother and I, and he named me Lady Day, and I returned the compliment and called him the president. Well, that was a nice compliment. You know, Lady Day, many of your friends, among the greatest names in modern music here tonight, to honor you and to help us tell your story. Artie Shaw, Potts Hollingworth, Mae Bonds, <laughs> Arthur Herzog, <laughs> Leonard Feather, and many others. Now, we want you, Lady Day, to sit back and listen to the words of the story that you already know. And from time to time, we will hear a voice representing yours and perhaps some of your feelings. But we'll call on you to set the music to our words. It's an important story, Lady, that you have to tell for us. For many people have taken beauty into their lives out of the bitterness of yours. And because of that, no comeback has been too tough for you to take. 
We have said that to understand the story of the Lady of the Blues, you've got to understand the blues. And the blues goes by many names. The blues is all the things I ever wanted to do and never got around to doing. Oh, there are a lot of things, a lot of everyday, taken for granted normal things that Billie Holiday never got around to doing. Right from the beginning in Baltimore, her parents were a couple of teenage kids. And although the slums forced you to face life pretty early, there was no doubt that Billy was an unwanted responsibility. She was born into isolation, born into the blues. Her father did what so many teenage boys do, he had to. He sold newspapers, ran errands, and went to school. And Clarence Holliday later became a great guitarist with Fletcher Henderson and Don Redmond. But Billy hardly knew him. He left while she was too young to understand that the life of a little girl without a father is a lonely road. That's why, Billy, I cuddle so close to my little girl every chance that I get. But the road had to be traveled by Billy through the streets of segregation, where at the age of six, she was scrubbing the famous white steps of Baltimore for nickels that held back hunger. There were jobs after school, on the days that there was time to go to school. Oh, you grow up faster than you can afford to. And the sixth grade is about the end of the line for a child who travels all alone, yes. If you want to understand the pattern of the blues that in later life made so much for that lonely bitterness and the mean fight that you have to understand, one of those things Billy never got around to doing was being like a child. Now, Billy, it is the usual part of our procedure in this show to introduce from the audience the family of our guests, those near ones who were there and who are there to give the strength of security needed when their kinfolk are in trouble. But there's no one here to remember for Billy, no family, not a single relative that she knows. Yes, as I said, the blues are lonely. And there are things that frighten the little girl into growing up overnight. I took care of my great-grandma from the time I was six till I was eight. She was very old and very sick. She always had to sit up in the rocker, and the doctor said not to let her lie down or she would die. That day, she begged me to let her lie down just for a little while. I was so tired, I lay down on the floor with her. Grandma kept saying verses from the Bible, and they loved me to sleep. When I woke up, she was dead. She was quite old. I was in her arms. Yes, George, she was very old. She was 109 years old. My goodness. But she was pretty sharp on the Bible. She could quote every word of the Bible, note for note. Note for note. And then Billy and her mother left Baltimore and moved to New York, to 145th Street, near 7th Avenue. It was a cold winter in a cold town, and hunger pains in New York hurt just as much as they do in Baltimore. Rent was due. She was about to be evicted. She was 14. In her own words, she and Mama were so hungry they barely could breathe. And so the blues drove her to a career. The blues ain't nothing but a cold, cold day, hungry and sad. Yeah, she walked down 7th Avenue from 145th to 133rd Street, stopping every way she could, trying to find work. And she stopped by Pods and Jerry's, later known as the Log Cabin Club. And a piano player said, honey, can you sing? Sure, she could sing. Sang around the house all the time. Piano player said, okay, started to play, traveling all alone, and she tried it. Her first boss, Pat Hollingsworth, should remember that. I'll never forget it. The things, the feeling that Billy put into that song were positively amazing. Everyone was listening. And when she finished the song, there was a lot of tears, including some of mine. There's never anyone like Billy. And so she had a job, and she ran out the door, bought a whole chicken, and ran right up to 7th Avenue through that cold weather. But that didn't matter, because she and her mother ate pretty well that night. And Lady Day, that was the first stage of her career, singing in the joints for her own people and for the others who came to seek out jazz. She played them all, the Hotchet Club, Yeah Man, the Alhambra Grill, Mexico's, and Potts Hollywood was right. There's never been anyone like Billy. No, sir. Some of her fellow singers found that out, too, like Mae Bond. She was a star of the place, and Billy was breaking in. She's here from the Beaussoir Club to tell us that Billy could make life pretty tough then, couldn't she, Mae? Yes, you know, in those days, we had a box we'd call the Kitty, and we kept all our tips in. 
At the end of the evening, we'd take the tips and split between all the singers. But Billy only wanted to keep what was hers. But uh, all of a sudden, she decided she only wanted to split with the band and nobody else. So she sure put an awful dent in that kitty, but in a hurry. No, there never went anyone like Billy, and that's what John Hammond found out. He heard her sing one night at Manat's place in April 1933, wasn't it? One song, and he realized that he'd found a great artist whose work should be brought before the world. So he took a friend to hear Billy, and that friend was a discoverer, too. That man was destined to bring swing up to big time, Mr. B.G. Benny Goodman. That was the middle 30s, yep. And the general public heard a new sound. In a way, this was the comeback of jazz. For in 1929, everything dropped, and jazz fell with it. Now, besides Goodman, there were names like Artie Shaw, Count Basie, Teddy Wilson. Swing was on the way up, and so was Billy. That was a new move for you, Lady Day. The next stage in your career, you became a band singer. And the first big band you joined, Count Basie. Count Basie, that's right. That's right. Swing was moving up, and so was Lady Day. There was a great musician who rated her voice second to none in the world. And he decided to take a chance, not on her voice, but in breaking a precedent. And so she joined another band. And then, Billy, you sang in front of the great clarinet of the great Artie Shaw. Yes, Billy sure sang in front of my band. As a matter of fact, I remember that I first met Billy back at Pod's place when it was called Pod's and Jerry's. That was back in around 1930. Billy was just a young kid then, and I was almost as hungry in those days as she was. I remember saying to her one day, Billy, if I ever make the grade and get a band of my own, you're going to sing with it. And sure enough, that's what happened. She did wind up singing with me. I've never regretted it because she added enormously. That's why I came over here tonight from the Embers, so that I could give her my heartfelt good wishes for the road she's going to have to travel from here on in. Yes. The blues took a big stall with you, Artie, and as for you, Billy, and all the moving crowds, you carried the blues with you. The blues is a one-way ticket from your love to nowhere. A little girl in Baltimore who never got around to being a child, still looking for those bright places in the world, and she traveled all alone. Though the money and the acclaim, she looked for what every child has known, and because her need was so great, she led with her chin and got pretty mixed up she knew what it was to sing about the no good man. And then the loneliest shadow of all passed over you. For the blues is a black crepe veil ready to wear. When mom died, it was all over. Losing a mother is anybody's heartache. But this was the only one in a whole world of people that had meant love. Yes, Billy, the blues were deepest. And you carried this loneliness to the peak of your popularity. You became a top solo artist. And the two people who were your idols are pretty proud. Yes, they were. Ah, oh, yeah, one was the Empress of the Blues, the great Bessie Smith, and the other was the inimitable Louis Armstrong. You said earlier, Billy, that you didn't try to sing. You just tried to improvise with your voice like Louis Horn. You wanted to feel that warm, sad feeling that pop feels. Billy Holiday thrilled me above all with her complete naturalness. Her great showmanship was the very last word in showmanship. She had the most unique voice and style I'd ever heard. What she felt when she sang, she felt with all she was. Yes, she captured that feeling of yours, Louis. And as people listened to her pour out those deep blues within her, they seemed to lose the little blues that they were feeling themselves. I don't know why, but I'm feeling so sad. Love a man, oh, where can you be? The night is cold and I'm so hard. Yes, the era of increasing popularity for Billy was on. More and more people felt her power in her records. It has been said that Billy Holiday comes as close to anybody ever will come to a personal appearance on records. There are people here who are important in a record story. The man who collaborated with her on God Bless the Child and Somebody's on My Mind, who with Irene Wilson wrote for Billy Some Other Spring, Mr. Arthur Herzog. Some Other Spring was written in a spirit of deep affection. 
It had to do with the rebirth of love, and we hope this is it for you, Lady Day. Some other spring. Billy became a singer-singer, not only loved by the public, but by true artists in every field of entertainment. Here's what one of the great personalities of our time has to say. This I can safely say without fear of contradiction. You are the greatest. Welcome home, darling, and God bless you. And with the powerful, strange fruit in which Billy sang the vital blues of her people, her success was assured. Milton Gabler, then with the Commodore label, took a chance on it when other companies had retreated. And he found that the public acclaimed honesty. It was the biggest record of Lady Day's career. Complete recognition. And the climax of her acclaim was at the Metropolitan Opera House in 1944. Billy sang at the Esquire All-American Jazz Concert. The first performance given by a jazz singer at the Met. Leonard Feather of Downbeat Magazine and one of the outstanding authorities of jazz produced that concert, and he can tell you what he and his fellow critics felt. Well, I've been rooting for Lady Day for so long, I felt as proud and happy as if I'd won an award myself. It was one of those rare occasions when the critics found nothing to argue about. The following year, she again won the Gold Esquire Award, this Esky statuette. And it was presented to her at a concert by the late Jerome Kern. And she continued to win the Esquire poll every year that we ran it. Yes, it was the very top of the wave. The blues ain't something with sense enough to get up and go. No, nobody's child was caught in the jungle. She couldn't get out. She had to cover reality with a haze. To hide from a world that was unkind, that had been unkind, she went to a world that makes you forget momentarily. Then came the leeches. The no good man found there was money to be had. Big money following around from dressing room to dressing room, waiting and overcharging. And then that day in May 1947, the rush to the car in Philadelphia, the shots fired by the Federal Asians, and the blues inside weighed a terrible ton. Good morning, honey. You old gloomy say. Good morning, honey. Thought we said goodbye last night. I've turned them tossed until it seems you have gone. But here you are with the dawn. Wish I'd forget you. But you're here to stay. It seems I met you when my love went away. Now every day I start by saying to you, Good morning, hearty, what's new? got to fight back and sometimes it's the right way and sometimes it's the wrong way. Billy knew it was the wrong way. She went before the judge in Philadelphia and pleaded guilty and volunteered to take the hospital cure. She hadn't found love herself but from those people whose blues she lifted by absolving you to their own from those loving people that came over 3,000 letters of faith. The year of darkness passed. There was a comeback to make, a long way to go and a short time to make it. Lady Day here took seven days to prepare her concert at Carnegie Hall. It was Easter, not a good day for show business, but the best year in the day for people to start a new life. The friends of Lady Day filled the house, 
so it did overflowed all over the stage, breaking all records. The comeback was immediate and definite, and the blues grew mellow. Yeah, Billy could stop singing about no good men. The emptiness was replaced with understanding in the person of her husband and closest advisor, Louis McKay. And the comeback might have been complete, but the pressures remained. For years, she was hounded from coast to coast by unrelenting, suspicious people. Although there was nothing to prove, she had been denied the right to appear in New York nightclubs, the most important showcase for any performer in her line of business. And since that trouble six years ago, poor Billy spent a fortune, all of us saving, to clean up the mess and the stigma. Isn't that so? That's right, George. Well, I would do it all over again. There's no excuses. I'd do it all over again if I can prove to the kids and to people that you don't have to do wrong things to big success. You bet your life. And my hat's off to you, lady, because it takes a lot of courage to say that. And I want to tell you something. I think it's time for you to sing a song, so let's get on with it. Yes, I'm going to ask you to sing for us in a minute, Billy. And we'll know what you're singing about, because we know from your story, Lady Day, that the blues ain't nothing but a good woman feeling bad.